Yeah, so um, we have been recording them and then providing the, the slides for people as well because they do have some great links in them. And uh, also if people are thinking that they wanted to start at this time and then, uh, or they might not have been able to make this one, but they could watch the video and join into the next one. So uh, I think it works out great. So uh, just for those who I might not have met, I, I think I've met most, but uh, I'm Madeline Law, so the Associate Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning. So thanks so much for coming here today uh, to join us in uh, talking through our ideas and thoughts about uh, large classes and uh, definitely one of the the areas that we want to be able to support your efforts as you begin to create and as you roll these out in the fall. Um, I have obviously my fabulous colleagues here from CBI with Julia and uh, Lisa and uh, we would like to be able to address your questions as they come up through the session. So please feel free to uh, put some questions in the chat or if you want to, you can raise your hand obviously um, and we can make sure that we get to those. We'll, we'll try to get through sort of the presentation and pieces uh, and leave some time for discussion. Um, so in, in looking at that, do you want me to get started then, Julia? We're good to keep going? Awesome, yeah, so on the next slide, uh, Julia, you've got that right. Oh, okay, yeah, I guess I'm I'm the controller. All right, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah, true. I can do it. Awesome, thank you. So on the agenda, obviously we just did a quick uh, uh, welcome. We're going to jump into a little activity to give you an idea of something that you could potentially uh, use maybe in your small group seminars. And then we'll talk about integrated design. We'll do a bit of a wrap up and uh, continue to, to move forward. But what I thought was really important to start out with, if you go to the, the third slide, is that um, we want to know, I wanted to provide you with a bit of a roadmap on what to expect within these, these four sessions. So with that, uh, we, we were thinking through, okay, where, where's, where are people's heads at and what are we thinking at, about right at this moment? And what uh, we've come up with is sort of this four stage plan of saying, okay, let's just get a, a feel for where we're at in terms of a general approach about how do we design these courses, S hear from you, listen to you in terms of what you're interested in so that we can then come back maybe in, well, in the second, week to focus on idea generation. So provide you with some examples, uh, lessons learned, tips and tricks based on the information and some of the, the comments that you provide us with today. Then the third week, we would focus more so in on your course learning outcomes together with aligning assessment. And then hopefully at the end, be able to help you solidify what your approach will be. And with that, uh, allow you to really think about what you'll be doing to create the courses and where to get the resources that you might need uh, if uh, as you're creating your courses. So on the next slide, Julia, you want to walk us through this one? You're muted. <laughs> This is part of the ed, the ed tech bingo so that you can cross that off that somebody talked while muted um hopefully we'll get not get all of them today so um hopefully everybody can click this link it takes you to our etherpad where we can do a collaborative editing exercise which is good for groups of uh 40 or less so we're at 33 people and we just have some key prompt ideas and it's great for kind of uh brainstorming and idea generation a couple of you have used it already i know that um, andre has used this in his um first year uh, mars course um so let's uh pop if you can click on that link and it will take you over Please let us know in the chat if you have access to chat. I'm sorry, Joanne, who doesn't? Um, if, if for any reason you can't click that link. Is it working for everybody? I guess I'll go over to the etherpad with you and see. Yeah, there's 20 people there already. Excellent. And you'll notice what's happening in the in there is that you each get your own color. So choose a new line and then uh, just start filling in the, the sections. And so this Etherpad tool is actually um, kind of keeping a, a tracking of, of everybody's contributions. 
And so there's a back end um, thing that if you were to use it in your your seminars as um, as a way of uh, collaboratively working on a document, it actually can report back um, who contributed what and how often. Um, and there is a replay button so you could watch it get rebuilt. It's basically a very basic text based uh, Google Docs. I'm going to be quiet so you can actually think about the answers. And just another idea, I know with uh, with my class, I often do a whiteboard uh, type of seminar to start things out is like, what were your key learnings, big challenges in the material this week? So I use this in a way to sim stimulate that discussion to start the seminars. So this could be an online way in which those seminars could start with, uh, you know, the 20 students in that first year seminar, if that makes sense. All right, we got some interesting um, interesting points here. So some people do have uh, some experience in some of the online uh, delivery or in a blended type of model. Excellent. All right, so um, in thinking through this, we'll be able to come back to this as well and uh, pull some of the ideas and the things that we're seeing here into uh, next week's uh, session where we'll talk about some examples and some tips and tricks to provide you with some some ideas around what we're what you're talking about here. Um, the thought of delivering a course online makes you feel and I think we uh, we are definitely seeing a range of being excited, being nervous, worried, stressed. I know that uh, you're not alone, let's put it that way, is that uh, there is a lot for us to think through, but I definitely think it collaboratively that we can do that. So in terms of reframing for online course design, as much as we would all love to just say, I'm gonna take what I've been doing for you know a number of years and I'm just gonna throw it into that online environment. We know that that's not an effective way in which to create a course that will allow you to achieve your learning outcomes in an online environment. Uh, thinking about how we focus on these learning objectives, reimagining what that course assessment will look like, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, as well as really, you know, drilling down and being reflective of what are your need to haves? So what do you have to have to have in your course to ensure your students achieve the, the learning outcomes? And then what are those nice to haves that you might have had that you don't really need? And how do we how do we bracket that? The idea of learner equity is really important. We need to think about accessibility. We need to think about those individuals who might be at home with their kids who are uh, you know, around them and they're having to do uh, care while they're trying to do a three hour lecture is probably not the most effective way and good learning experience. Uh, as well as having access to high bandwidth if they're in rural areas and maybe don't have the access to uh, internet. Hence the reason why I'm at Brock because my internet was terrible this morning. So I jumped in my car to get here to do some sessions. I, I think we need to really be uh, cognizant of the way in which we create learning activities in our online environment, as well as our assessments to ensure a, a learning experience that's equal and accessible um, across all of our students. So on the next slide, uh, we we have here this idea of rethinking the contact hour. And uh, for, for us to think about it being, often it's that 36 hours is a half credit course and whatever, 70 some odd uh, for a full credit course. But really, uh, at this point, we really want to be thinking about how much information and types of activities and assessments are required to ensure that the students actually achieve the learning outcomes. And I really like these two quotes here that I pulled from uh, an online source, and I think I had it, I'll try to pull it up. It was a, it was a really interesting article. Um, so what's, what does being in class mean when you and your students have access to a classroom space for 24 hours a, uh, a day? Uh, and so really what we want to do is think about outcome-based education instead of hours-based education. And if we can rethink 
frame our thinking around that, then we will be able to identify what types of learning activities we should pull together in this online environment so they have that experience. Now we see that Chantal has a, a question. Would you like to unmute and ask that? Yes, am I the only one not seeing any slides? Because I, I don't see, I just see um, like a gray uh, window right now. Hmm. Fascinating. We actually had that problem in the last session with one person. Uh, are you on a Mac by any chance? I am. We're, we're doing our own little internal research. Uh, it tends to be one of those things. It might be worth jumping out of the session and come back in and maybe that will help uh, to be able to reset that. But okay. um, if Sorry not, for the interruption. I will try that. Thank you. No problem. We will make the video available together with uh, the slides so that everybody can have access to those. Thank you. So on um, this one, uh, well, and I see an interesting question here. How should I take into account consideration of Zoom fatigue in terms of the amount of information? And I, I feel that. I won't say Zoom because we don't use Zoom, but but I am Microsoft Teams and life-sized out some days. And so um, with that, I think this next slide that we have up here around synchronous and asynchronous just hits the mark on that in saying, what is the material that you need to provide in an, or and can provide in an asynchronous learning space that allows the students to learn the material and the concepts that you would like them to learn? And what does that look like? And how can you engage in that space? And what is that potentially synchronous type of learning experience that we still want our students to have? Because I'm an instructor too, and I can't even imagine not seeing my students or not being somehow engaged with them on a weekly basis so that they feel connected to my course. We wanna make sure we're not at Brock, I would say, we don't want to just take something in a can and put it over here and say, go do and send me your assignments, we'll mark it and you get the credit. We really have been hearing from students and we see it in their um, their tweets, in their Instagrams, that they want to feel connected to their courses. So what that connection can look like, it doesn't have to be three hour lectures that uh, students are having to sit there and listen to. Instead, how can we chunk that material into you know, 15 minute videos that are pre-recorded and put forward? How can we uh, provide them with live chat experiences? So this is kind of that funny in-between ground of saying, you know, within a 24 hour period, maybe on Fridays, every student has to go on and talk about one of their key learnings uh, from the course. So it's a little bit synchronous, but it's asynchronous as well. So there's a little bit of that kind of middle ground or you have those live um, live office hours that students can sign up for. You send them a meeting invite and then they they're able to zoom or not zoom to be on Microsoft Teams uh, to see you and have that interaction. Uh, Julia, there's also I know with uh, the Brock BU and the learning communities. Did you want to speak a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so starting next week, we're going to actually uh, be partnering with A to Z to, to share what's happening as far as support for, for learners so that the that you can focus on the teaching and learning part of your course and the technology and the sort of being a, a great online learner part can be part of learning services and building community. So uh, we'll, we'll begin having a session talking about that. They're calling it University 101, which you may have already heard a little bit about. Um, so it's just an opportunity for you to tap into that. And hopefully maybe there'll be some components that you could pull um, in partnership with these uh, with A to Z learning services that you could incorporate into your course. So it will be running through the summer to prepare them, but also it could be something uh, that you carry on forward. And so we welcome you to, it's on our event system, please sign up. Excellent. So again, I think the, the key piece here is thinking about what can you deliver in a synchronous way that the students can do at any time, any point, and what it, but what are those pieces that are the really need to haves for you in terms of synchronous? How do we do that in a learner equity uh, equitable way so that all students feel engaged but are able to engage in the way they they are able to? Um, so on the next slide, uh, we just have um, the, the this is the integrated course design ahead. yeah i just want to add to the the piece about the the equity piece uh jason just mentioned in the chat that he's had he has a student who has an, hasn't has lost internet for three days so it's a real it's a real issue and the fact that madeline who 
you know, otherwise has lots of uh, <laughs> lots of access, uh, has lost internet too. So we really want to be intentional. And part of that intention starts with thinking about what your learning goals are. So we're trying to simplify, this is uh, what Madeline was saying before about going just back to basics, the need, the need to have versus the, the nice to haves. So let's go right to what the learning goals are. Let's think about what kind of activities can support those learning goals and what kind of assessments um, would um, and feedback can you be providing that can work in in uh, tangent to all of those things? And of course, these are um, situated in the the situational factors. So, what is the context? That's kind of what that first question that we we're asking in the Etherpad. Um, you know, our first few questions, which I'll go to the next slide, is you know, knowing who your learners are, um, these situational factors. So it, you, we know that a student who's, uh, it's their major and is gonna take it very seriously versus somebody who's just taking it because it's an, um, it's a, an optional credit versus a context credit. These are all different situations that will change the way that they approach it and how you do your design. So when we're uh, doing the design, we wanna think uh, along Bloom's taxonomy. And so when you're thinking about your assessments, we wanna go a little bit beyond the remember. Of course, remember is, is important. That's why it's the foundation of this pyramid. It's sort of the, if you can't remember the basic facts, then you're not gonna be able to do the understand, apply or analyze. But what, let's try and align, if I go back to that triangle, thinking about aligning our assessment to our learning goals to make sure that those things are working together. Um, and even if that means uh, building upon, you know, one assignment that goes towards another thing. And I'll just do another pitch for our um, assignment design session that's tomorrow. Uh, it's another way of looking at Bloom's taxonomy. This is a uh, hand drawn by Julia, um, but has all the, the great verbs that you can use. Uh, so any of you have been through our um, uh, the ICAP process have had to pull out your verbs, but it is actually really helpful to think about what kinds of activities you're thinking um, your students will be doing to demonstrate what they know. Um, speaking of activities, so um, Madeline, do you want to speak to this? You had a... Yeah, for sure. I think the, the, the thing that we wanted to talk about here is that we have different types of teaching activities that we want to integrate to, into our course, not all of which have to be assessed in a way. So you might provide a fabulous uh, video and we can work with the library to look at copyright uh, requirements and make sure that those can be uploaded straight into Sakai or through uh, uh, the different channels that they have. Readings, uh, chapters, websites, what are the pieces uh, that your students want that you want your students to read, but also providing some of that narrative around it. So it's not just saying here, read this. It's here. This is what this this uh, this chapter is about. And here's a few questions that you might want to think about as you're reading this. So you're not just putting things out there for them to do, but you're curating it and you're talking about it in a way that would allow them to think about this and reflect on it and what that means to the course and the learning outcomes in general. Uh, you are able to in seminar uh, sessions. So if you did small group seminars online, have small group discussions, you can do that in the forums. You can do that on the etherpad that we saw. You can have, uh, students can do this. They can do oral presentations. They can lead discussions with their peers, uh, depending on how you've done that in the past in your seminars. You're able to provide them with uh, worksheets that they can then uh, work on through a small group session and then they upload into Sakai. So there's a lot of different ways in which we can think about similar assignments that you've wanted them to do in this environment using Teams or using uh, a number of the different tools that we have in Sakai. On the next slide there. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Just, just going right through. I'm, I skipped your example slide. Yeah, do you want me to pull this up and share my screen on this? Yeah, uh, so can you just, yeah, take over. Yep. Take All over. Right. So I, one thing that people have been asking for are examples of how we have put courses together. So I have uh, started to put together, well, not started, I have uh, put together my, um, my mass, it's a master's level course, but I still think it has a lot of application. The assessments are just quite different. Uh, can you see this now, Julia? It's good? 
OK, so the way in which the lessons uh, works is that you can have all of your information really curated right along the side here in different lessons. I'm doing a course where I look at leadership and then I look at change and then I look at leadership and change and organizational performance. So the way that I've put it together is I've created asynchronous uh, lessons and I've released all of the leadership ones and then they have a major assignment that happens after that then I'll release all of the org culture or change ones and then they have another major assignment and so on so I've done it sort of in lessons that are in modules based on topic and uh, to do that I've provided and you'll see as you kind of go down yeah that's a lot of reading but when you read through it it's more so guiding the students to what they'll be seeing so I always provide them with a bit of a quote just you know something that I like to do you can provide them with their own self checklist so they can just check in what they've done and you can actually follow up on that as an instructor. I'd click here and show you, but then you'll see my students' names. So you can see who has checked, done the checklist and, and engaged in those activities. You can make that part of the requirements of the course and say, you know, did Jenny always do everything in the module? And that can be part of uh, part of your, your uh, requirements. Uh, you have learning objectives. I put an overview. Here's a, I always have a video. I have readings. And then at the end, uh, I section break it so I so that the students know that this is the stuff that I just need to go through. Uh, in other sections, I'm trying to find one of my other ones here. I have a. Um, I also had a video that I did with a PowerPoint slide and my my own um, my own talking head there going through it. It was four or five minutes long, but it provided them with a guidance of what I wanted them to get out of that session. And so I, I do this where this is the intro up front here with the checklist. I have uh, the content in what I want them to do. And then at the end, uh, this is where I would say is kind of the, the to do's. So what do they have to do now? So now they learned this, they were, did their readings. Um, here I have something, I have an optional test your knowledge type of quiz, but you could make that a weekly quiz for your students to engage in. I also have a link to a forum where they can ask questions about some of the readings. And again, this is a master's class, so it becomes a little bit different. You could make this a requirement that they are they have to post uh, a comment or a hundred words every week about the readings. And uh, there's a number of different things. So the way that I kind of pull it together is to say, OK, here's all the asynchronous stuff you have to do. But then for me, I was thinking, well, how do they I still make them feel connected to the course? And so biweekly, what I've been doing is I have biweekly leadership um, videos. So I'm actually interviewing a leader. It, my course is about leadership in, in public health. So you can imagine that's a pretty hot topic. So I am interviewing leaders about their perceptions of what's happening in their leadership styles. So I have these lovely videos and that's a way for me to allow the students to see a connection by of what's going on in the course. They see my face a little bit because we know students are asking for that and that is a helpful um, kind of way to keep them engaged and know that there's a face behind the course and it's not just a bunch of words. Um, this is again just one way that you can set things up. It's a joinable site so you're welcome to join and have a look at how I've done this and uh, definitely I'm open to critiques as well so if you have uh, any any comments. But it's something that um, here I'll just pull this down and you can share the PowerPoint now, Julia. Yeah, and Lindsay's saying that she loves the use of the check checklist, which I think is one of the best features of lessons. So I'll say two things. First, that there is a lessons uh, session on how to use lessons on Friday. So you're welcome to come join if you want specifically the how to. But our flexible teaching and learning site also has a really good kind of short video on on step by step on how you can create lessons. Um, but the checklist I found, I use it in my teaching as well, actually really helps me kind of decide what's going to happen. So it's it organizes me as as well as it organizes the students and the feedback I've gotten from the students is they love it because they're like I did that <laughs> and they're able to move on to the next thing okay I'm going to click and upload that uh, PowerPoint again sorry awesome oh Friday session is full well there's going to be another one next week sorry that is possible they might have capped it um, unlike me who just let everybody come through the doors and last uh yesterday we had a ta workshop with for a hundred people which was uh too many people by the way but um 
you know, for engagement, which is, I think, speaking to this point about large classes and synchronous sessions, um, it was really an information uh, dump and it kind of confused people because I was talking so quickly, showing all these things. Speaking of which, I'm sorry as I'm flashing through all these slides, we're just reloading back up to where we were. This is the example. Oh, and we wanted to talk about instructional video. So Madeline, you had a, a quite a few different examples of video. You were pulling from YouTube and plus you had made some of your own. Um, yeah. So um, I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, the key to the video production piece is if you look around at what students are creating and what people are creating, they're creating TikToks and they're creating YouTube videos. The actual quality is something that people are saying, oh, I need it to be like professional quality. It's got to be X, Y, and Z. Uh, I don't, and what we're finding is students are saying, no, we just want to feel engaged. We want to feel connected. We want to hear from the individual. We know that you can use your phone and I, I'm, I don't know if I said this because I said it in my other session, but I had my daughter videotape me to doing doing an introduction and you can upload it right on your phone into a certain um, system and it goes right into uh, your content and you can upload it into Sakai. So I had a two minute video done in and uploaded into Sakai in 15 minutes and it was fantastic. So I think those are the kind of things that you want to think about in terms of connecting frequency as compared to you want to make sure it's a good quality, but it doesn't have to be uh, production level quality. Uh, the one uh, option here, and we'll make sure you have this link uh, to and maybe you probably put it up there already is making super simple videos for teaching online, which is has some really great tips and ideas. So on the next slide, I think we talk a little bit about yes, assessment. Now I'm going to jump right in here because I know that one of the questions is going to be is how do we do virtual proctoring of exams? And I wanted to highlight the fact that Brock is in the process of looking at what's called e Proctor Track. And this is an eCampus Ontario ministry level uh, solution that was bought for universities. It was adopted by a few with limited success here and there. Uh, we are piloting it. Uh, there's a number of concerns related to this software. It's a surveillance software that watches your students. It locks down their browser. It watches their head movements up and down to the side. It flags anything as potential cheating. Uh, it's a it's it's one of those things where it's been a solution brought out for what we think is a major problem in that we're trying to, you know, get students to do exams and be uh, honest and not cheat. We already know that students have worked around all of these types of systems and they're able to do that in a, quite an effective way. And so what we are doing now is we're still going through the pilot to see how this works, how it integrates with Sakai, what might be the user case around this, and we will be providing recommendations to uh, the BPA uh, to be able to take a, a a stance around this and uh, I love the whisper from Netta about getting rid of exams. I haven't given an exam in years, but I I, I get it. I, I know that this is this is one of those pieces that's important uh, in some situations. However, I think the way we test just needs to be rethought is, you know, how can we test in this environment where we ask a question that they have to go and search up and they have to find it and uh, they have to Google it and they have to analyze whether the information they're getting is the right stuff to answer the question. And I know that has implications around teaching assistance and marking and things like that, but those are the kind of uh, the, the conversations that we need to be thinking about and having. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I know that uh, it's an important one to, to chat about and, and think about. So, uh, and I see a question here. So, I was going to ask if we have a policy whether exams make any sense for online teaching. So I will say if it's open book, uh, if it has the right questions, then it's uh, you could still call it an exam, but it's an open book exam is really the, the sort of approach that we've been talking about and thinking through. There's no official policy though. Yes, no which, policy. <laughs> which I, I would like, I would love for us to have one, but I don't think we have that kind of but you, why don't you move that forward through Senate? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then looking at uh, the different assessment pieces, there's a number of different ideas. 
ideas there. Uh, here's another one that I think is important for us to identify as a lot of uh, interesting and uh, kind of vulture-ish type of tech uh, vendors have been coming out of the woodwork. I think the day that Brock put out their announcement, I had about 50 emails from different uh, companies saying, here, buy some licenses for Brock. And what we know is that uh, some of them are great. Some have some really cool ideas. There's this doodly, doodle, doodly one. There's Toonly that can make you some cool videos that you could embed into your course. If you're feeling like that's something that you're able to do and you want to spend the time to learn and engage and, and work on that, that's something definitely to look into. However, they have licenses and they have costs. And if they require uh, any level of push of student information or Brock uh, information back and forth, that has to go through a privacy agreement with the company before that kind of information can be released. So depending on what type of tech it is, it's always worth, worth asking CPI because we can't keep track of everything that's out there and there might be a groundswell of individuals who are looking at certain things that we can then further investigate and say hey yeah this is really cool and maybe we need to put a case around this to get funding to support that so definitely you know check out the cool tech keep it open but know what you're comfortable with and we have great platforms already to do a lot of the video stuff so that's an important thing to to consider uh, next slide there, Julia. There's some questions popping up about software licensing, um, which is, is, is how much is Brock willing to pay for those costs? I mean, you have to make a compelling argument and get a lot of people on board. Um, so we kind of have the tools we have currently. Yes. And so things like the ones that I was just showing there, I think they were like $20 a month for a subscription. Uh, so, you know, there's things like that that are um, possible to, to purchase, I guess, maybe even talking to your chair or to uh, your deans might be another place to, to ask for that. Um, I also see uh, a little a question about hardware. Um, so I know that definitely people are spending money on uh, different levels of hardware. I know that I brought I bought a ring light, which has now been co-opted by my daughter, who is doing TikTok dances with it. But I had I didn't have a lot of good lighting, so I, I used I bought that. But what we are doing, and I'll throw it out there, and I know that uh, we we only have a few of them to start, but we're we're looking at putting together what's called a video studio in a box. So if you were thinking that you wanted to do some recording of yourself doing a demonstration or doing something that uh, you need to have that video with, then that might be something that you could reach out to us and we can either advise you on certain hardware that you might want to purchase or get from your departments or uh, maybe this is available. So we're actually, we're getting the boxes. We're just trying to figure out all the infection control stuff around those and then we'll be able to make those available. I uh, then moving forward around uh, feedback. Did you want to talk to this one or Julia? Well, just that we, uh, I mean, we have some good questions about feedback. Like when you have a really large class uh, of 160 with limited um, TA hours, how can you really do give effective feedback? But we know that um, feedback is actually more important than giving the grade, although our students say they want the grade. But um, when you give uh, meaningful feedback, um, it really does uh, help the learning along, but there's different ways it can be done. So uh, it doesn't all have to be done in written. You can actually do it um, with audio feedback. There's some research that shows that when you do the intonation and or when you're doing a video that um, it helps them understand what, what the issues were uh, with whatever the assignment was. There's also some uh, opportunities to do peer feedback. So in the larger classes, possibly you could make a certain percentage so that the students give each other feedback. And that has, uh, the research says about that, that has a two level approach because when you are giving a peer uh, feedback on how they did, you actually look at the criteria a lot more than you would normally, and you end up, do, the the quality of the work tends to go up, which is a great uh, side effect of, of introducing peer feedback. Um, so you could use a component of that in your course. Sakai has an automatic peer feedback. We're trying some other methods using Office Forms, um, or even within uh, student pages, there's some opportunities to do peer feedback. Um, 
And so, yeah, there's lots of different opportunities, but the key thing, is, uh, there's a little prompt here. Have you considered using rubrics? Uh, criteria is really important so that when you're giving feedback, it's based on the criteria that you had um, set out from the beginning, um, just giving some clear guidelines of what your expectations are so that when you're giving feedback, it's aligned with what you had said were the expectations. Um, I'm, uh, there was some other, there was another comment that I wanted to address, but maybe we'll, we were definitely keep track of all these uh, messages and collect all the resources to share back with you. There was something important I wanted to mention about assessments and feedback, but we'll so carry is, on for now. There is yep. one question um, from Jason around the rubrics built into Sakai. Uh, um, is that an update that's coming? That's coming July 1st. Uh, I can't actually, maybe Elisa could speak to that because she's seen what it looks like. I haven't looked into the new one. What do you think, Elisa? Is it going to change our whole world? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to, I'm not sure it's going to change the whole world, but I think it's going to um, change how assignments as well as tests and quizzes can be set up that the rubrics are available in both tools, both the assignments and the tests and quizzes tool. Um, and they seem to be, we're still doing our, our QA testing, making sure that that all works properly. Um, Julie, I love how you went ahead and promised that. <laughs> I was like, hopefully, hopefully we will have that. Um, oh. <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> the whole update thing is a go, like we have to make the decision on Friday, whether it's going to be working for us, but, um, we're going to, uh, yeah, I think rubrics built into the assignments are going to help facilitate that feedback piece quite a bit. Yeah, and I'm seeing some comments about um, diff challenges with peer feedback, and I agree. I, I have had some pushback where it's been challenging to get um, either the, the quality of feedback where it's not just like, yeah, great, or sometimes they're very harsh and I found it to be really challenging. So it's it's almost setting up, um, you know, how do you give good feedback, which is a great skill we can all learn. Um, so that's something that we could uh, probably explore more as well. Um, and uh, they, uh, the, oh, the point was about the assessments, uh, talking about how to design assessments, which is what is uh, happening tomorrow, but you're right, there should be probably more. We're happy to talk to you on an individual basis too. Not everything needs to be a one hour workshop. Maybe, you know, feel free to contact us and we'll like meet with you and work out how it could work in your particular course. Um, yeah, I don't know how they work either, Roberto, and maybe I shouldn't even promise that the rubrics were going to be there. <laughs> Apparently I'm pre, pre I'm uh, being a little bit ambitious. Uh, uh, in in the ideal scenario so we'll, stay tuned we'll let you know soon <laughs> so um on this slide we just wanted to highlight uh the supports that cpi and uh the provost and the deans and all of us have talked about and are working towards is um the two instructional support assistants. So there's first there's the online TA programming that uh, Julia was alluding to. A hundred of them showed up already uh, to a session, and uh, these will be ongoing throughout the summer. Even though students are not clear maybe what they are be going to be TAs for, uh, they are welcome to to these sessions so that they're they're getting prepared. Uh, the instructional support assistants. Uh, hopefully that will be posted today, and, and uh, from there we will have two individuals per faculty who are assigned 160 hours for 16 weeks to really think through and develop supports for TAs for online learning and also to conduct workshops with a bit of a specific focus within your uh, area. So there will be a, uh, a needs assessment kind of survey that will go out to faculty to say, you know, what are some of the things you want your TA to be able to do in your course? So I wanted to highlight this because as you're putting together your course design and your thinking thinking through what this is all going to look like in your course, uh, keep a keep track of what is it that your, your TA is going to have to do. Will they have to facilitate uh, forums? Will they have to facilitate uh, synchronous seminars with uh, students? And what will they do in that? Is it a free flowing discussion and or is it something that you're going to have very specifically set up? So once we know those kind of things, we'll be able to work with these uh, instructional support assistants to help you create some of the resources that you'll 
need and to prepare your, the TAs that will be working in your in your class. So uh, definitely uh, work it. We know the TAs, especially in the large uh, classes, are key to the success of the, the course. They're also uh, generally going to be that first point of contact for uh, any of the students. And so we, we want them to be really prepared and ready to engage and do so in a way that as the instructor, what you want them to be working as as TAs. So definitely uh, what we will be focusing in on in the next little while. There's some really uh, great points about, yeah, I'm not, I'm not always going to answer them. I was just going to bring them up for you to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Two great points about, um, you know, hiring, the timing of the hiring and asking people to work for free. Like I said, we did have 100 TAs show up yesterday who are really keen and really eager and they're running. Uh, it's a, it's a, It was a one hour session yesterday and then over two weeks they're participating online asynchronously through Sakai. So some people are really uh, excited to be involved, but also, yeah, it, it, there is an issue there. So maybe I'll let Madeline answer that one. Yeah, I think one of the, the key things that we've been talking about is how do we get our TAs hired sooner? And we've had those discussions with uh, associate deans and deans to say, how can we do this? Uh, so I know that's in, you know, it's a conversation and we're working through that. Um, I, I understand that asking, we're, we're not actually asking them to attend these workshops, but if they do, uh, it's for their own professional development at this point as well. We're not saying it's just to do the TA in the fall, like you have to do these. Uh, what we have proposed as well is if we're able to allocate time within their uh, hours of allocation uh, to allow them to go to these workshops and that would be definitely a, a good win to uh, support their professional development. So that's really where we're at. I wish we could hire them now and uh, then, you know, that would be great. But I know that we have a lot of different constraints around those pieces. It was interesting because um the steward came to the session yesterday and they had advertised it through QP. So I was, I, I mean, we weren't, there was, it's completely optional at this point, yeah. but they seem to be, they want to get um, ready yeah. for it. Um, and Jackie, Jackie, there were marker graders in there and there are some very specific sessions coming up for TAs about uh, marking and grading so they can get that experience on how to do that from the TA perspective. Um, it does depend on how much access you give them. So that is another thing we try and give them the gamut of like what, looking what it looks like from a student up to instructor access. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, we wanted to leave the the last uh, 15 minutes for some questions or to identify anything in the chat that we might have missed. You can definitely throw that in there again. Uh, as we uh, had identified in the beginning that this is just one of many. So if you've been to one or two of the other ones this week, you might see some, some familiar types of slides. So I apologize, but we wanted to make sure we were having a nice consistent flow across our uh, different topics, but then we'll explore and go deeper into specific examples for large class, for small group uh, classes. So uh, I just wanted to, to make that clear that the next week our focus will be on taking some of the, the questions that you've had here as well as in the Etherpad to put together a session that'll address uh, some examples, tips and tricks and lessons learned uh, that'll help to support you in these large classes. Uh, so. Uh, I guess that's all I really have to say at this point. We'll just open it up for uh, any other questions and uh, go from there. And we see some chat questions coming in, um, but also feel free to take the mic if you want to if you want to talk. Um, maybe we'll address Joanne's question about giving TAs. Um, Madeline, how is that going to roll out as far as giving them the names and just being like, go see them for assistance? Is that the idea? So are we, sorry, I'm just pulling it up here. Are we allowed to give TAs the two names and email contacts so they can contact them? Um, you know, I haven't really thought that far ahead. I'm thinking that's really going to be a part of the model will be, you know, go to your lead TAs. They're going to be part of our team until uh, about the end of October because of the, you know, we want to have that pre and during. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that and I'll definitely get back to you on that one. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Some good questions coming in. Yeah, excellent. So Rebecca, TA marker graders coming in September as new students. Are they able to get training during the summer, even if they're not at Brock yet? So that's a interesting one, because I know I have a grad student who doesn't have access uh, through an IT 
thing, Julia. We we've been having this uh, this conversation and getting earlier access. Well, uh, as a student, though, if we accept them as a student, they do get a student ID, so they can access the systems using their student ID, which I said yesterday in the TA workshop, and then somebody said, uh, you know, that it, that wasn't preferred, but I mean, if, if they want to and they want to sign up to any of the CPI workshops, they're welcome to, and they can access all of the resources through their student ID, so that might be a, a temporary measure. Otherwise, it's four weeks before the contact, contract. Um, I think is when you get your staff account um, set up, which is confusing for our new students because they technically will go through two different channels to get their courses. Right. Uh, there's a question about uh, retaining uh, ownership of pre-recorded lectures. That was I, me, uh, Tom Farrell. <laughs> do you mean you want to prevent students from downloading and sharing them, or do you mean well, you don't want the university to reuse your material? All of the above. Um, okay, so yeah. you're a Bufa member. As a Bufa member, you you retain IP. Nobody would ever use your content um, for, without your express per, uh, written permission. But um, a lot of people, uh, as far as student uh, student use, you know, like there, there's these course hero sites that people have been downloading material and uploading them. Um, it's not really easy to do if you use our ecosystem, but um, anybody with enough sophistication could probably figure it out uh, how to download it. I, I don't. I don't think that it, we haven't seen it happen with videos yet as far as students are concerned. So I wouldn't worry about the intellectual property. That's by all means that won't be that won't happen. But the the student um, downloading and reusing, w there are some sat to really tech savvy students who would know how to do it. It's not straightforward, though. That yeah. helps. OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, there was a question. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, there is a question about uh, getting a copy of this session and the slides. So we will be putting together a uh, a site where you'll be able to get this one together with any of the other sessions that we've had together with the slides. So we'll make sure that those are available uh, and we'll push that out to everybody that's been at these sessions. Uh, another question. Roberto, yeah. you're asking a great question about seminars. I want to reiterate this as much as possible before you confirm. Please keep your seminars. Even if you don't have anything live at all, allowing you to have some kind of small grouping is really useful because Sakai is group aware. So even if it's just assigning the assignments so that you can allow TAs to only access seminar one and seminar two so that you can do the allocation of workload. So it makes it so much easier for you. You don't have to you don't have to create groups. It's automatically created upon registration. So this is probably something I should say right from the outset. I would recommend it for even if you don't really have a lab or seminar that historically just to maintain the group status so that you can um, allocate workload is is really important. I would say as well around that is if uh, you, you keep those seminars because if students want to meet with their seminar leader, if they have a question about an ex, uh, uh, an assignment or whatever that might be, then that way they have that opportunity to meet with them at that hour because they should have that open. It should be scheduled in their uh, their system in their timetable. And even for there's some people who don't have uh, who don't ha have never had uh, seminars. I think uh, Patrick was saying before, you know, you have a class of 160 and you only have marker graders. Even if you have those in groups to do that assignment, it's much easier to manage as far as like as from a, an instructor management uh, TA management role to kind of allocate who's responsible for what. And it allows you to do some smaller group interactions that not necessarily would be seminar like, but you could actually create forums based on those groups or other interactions that um, don't need to be typically a seminar. Anyway, I would, if you have the opportunity, please uh, put in a seminar. Yeah. Or lab. And Elizabeth, I um, might have worked with uh, scheduling to try to make that happen. Um, for quite some time in the last month, uh, but it hasn't really worked within their system is uh, what I've been told in their existing system. So essentially just keep it there and you what we'll have to do as instructors is communicate out how that time on the timetable is going to be used in our course. And that can be a quick little 30 second video to say, 
Uh, the only thing that is synchronous is our seminars and you are required to do X, Y and Z at this time. Again, it, it is a little difficult and I saw a few people posting in the chat that, you know, what about people in different time zones? And that's a definite consideration. If you have a lot of international students that will be taking these courses, uh, having synchronous seminars is maybe not something that's possible. So really thinking strategically about who your learners are and, and what that could look like. So thanks. I know it's it's complicated and trust me, I really wish that was my ultimate goal was can we just say that like it's mostly synchronous and we have small seminars that are 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 a, or sorry it's asynchronous but synchronous for the seminars and make that work but it was not really possible the default is synchronous asynchronous asynchronous yeah um i think it makes sense to have asynchronous but that time is is there so that students know to to allocate that time so whether however you use that time you can but we need to come up with some kind of way of communicating that early, whether it's creating your Sakai site and send, and there's nothing in it, but you send a message out to say, this is how the course is gonna be. Here's the course outline, at least a little bit earlier. I would love for the registration system to have that information. Um, yes. um, Thomas asked a great question about practicing your lectures. So anybody can, you can go and call yourself. Um, I do that all the time. I just go have a, me a meeting with my own my own self and I practice uh, presenting and I can even do a recording of it, which is kind of cool. So I've tested and done my own feedback to myself like, wow, that that needs some work. So um, Teams is a great way to allows you to do that without having anybody else in your meeting. I didn't know that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a really easy way to make videos, actually. I'm. Uh, I mean, your bandwidth has to be good. Is the only thing. Yeah. Definitely. Excellent. Any other questions? Thanks for coming, Raymond. See you later. Next week. I'm just scrolling to make sure we didn't miss anything. So, okay, so there's a couple questions people are asking about where the, so this recording is still going on. Uh, when it's done, it will, you'll actually get a notification that it's been uh, done and it's it'll be in streams. And when you click the link, it will take you to streams. And so as an organizer, so um, I think, actually, I'm not sure who the organizer, I guess Wanda. Yeah. Yeah. will have the uh, the power to change all the details about who it's available for. You can actually download that video. Um, so what I've done for my video and what we're going to do for the ones that Madeline's done so far is we're going to re-upload them somewhere to be more public. So by default, only the people in this meeting can see the video. So that will happen for your classes as well. Only people in your class can see that video. You, when you go to stream, you'll notice that some people have made their videos open to the world, which is kind of interesting actually to see what kind of lecture videos are happening. Um, but those ones, that, so they change the settings to be available, but you can download it and you can also you could also get the embed code. So there's a couple different ways and maybe I shouldn't confuse you with all the different ways and maybe we'll just work together on that. If that's the way that you wanna do it, um, I can show you the steps and you can see which is easiest for you to try. Yeah, and the question around making videos in Teams, uh, that's actually how I've done um, some of the expert interviews that I did in my course is that I actually call them, I just start recording, we do a little thing, and then I save it as a file. And interestingly, when I did the interview, I didn't know this when I did it, is that I would just see their face there, but then when I downloaded it, uh, I would see myself and that person. So they would see me asking the question and then the individual answering it. So that was a really nice kind of feature. I didn't realize that that would happen. Um, as well, I, I would like to just also put in the plug around the accessibility aspect of this. I don't know if people have used this in Teams, but uh, you can turn on um, the captioning features. Can we do that on this one? Where is that? Live captioning. So you can turn on when you go to those three little dots, uh, you can click that and go up to uh, turn on live captions and that will happen right there. So if there is a requirement in your class or as just good practice and uh, aligned to universal design principles, it's a good thing to do so that uh, your students might be reading that. If maybe there's lots of noise going on, they have to mute something or they just want to read it instead, then uh, that's something to consider. Um, uh, seeing any other questions? 
Yeah, so Roberta, it's a two-step process. Um, I, I've gotten feedback from people that they don't like it when I show too much screen stuff. So I will show you individually how to do that. And we all put some, uh, in, well, maybe we'll put some instructions online so that I can just send you a link. Um, people have found it very confusing when I start jumping around, just click here and then click here and then go over here and then up here. It's really simple. <laughs> so I <laughs> promise I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> Yeah, and the chat will remain. So you'll notice whenever you go to uh, Teams, you'll see that there's the menu on the left and the chat will be there. So every meeting you've ever gone to has a history of all the chat that you've ever gone to, which is great and terrifying in some way. <laughs> I've just seen like the hundreds of meetings I've gone to, which is uh, amazing. But yeah, it, it persists. So all the links that we've been sharing, they're always there so you can go back and revisit, which we, we will do to make sure that we um, can answer all your questions and gather all these resources together for you. Okay, so all the people are running off. I just want to say a, a hearty yeah, thank goodbye. You. Thank you so much for coming. It was lovely to see you. I hope you're all well. And Take we can care. still, so still stick. Yeah. Yes, I will send. I think I have that in my. No, oh, I did not have that in my. I will send the link to register. Yeah. Which I guess they're filling up fast, which is great. Yeah. There's the registration link. And I guess we can stop the recording now. I will stop yeah. recording. <laughs>